Inasmuch as I'm about to pick up some of what we were mentioning last time we were taping in to expand upon it, and inasmuch as I was about to say something, especially to you people out there on tape at other times and other places, regarding almost again what this is not. But let me tell you why I, again, why I oftentimes tell you what this is not such as I was using, we're going to pick back up some of the examples that had to do with what seemed to be verbally talking about man's idea of religion and gods. And when I say that I'm not actually talking about religion and gods, it's not to protect any of you people who may be all entangled with ideas of religion and gods. And it's not in any way to verbally protect myself from saying something untoward. It is simply the fact that none of this is about anything, ultimately, of which you're aware, because if it was, it would be worse than me wasting your time. It would be that you didn't realize that I was wasting your time. That's how bad it would be. <laughs> so it's not some verbal game that I continue to throw in as prefaces and along the ways of saying that I'm going to pull out an example from politics or from economics or religion and then me say, now wait a minute, you people out there on tape, I'm not actually talking about religion. It has a very real reason. There is no ordinary basis for me describing how, rather than me to tell you it's not having to do with the subject at hand. It's not in some way to protect religion or politics. It's simply the fact that there is no other way to talk about what this is without talking about, on the surface, in the beginning of each little area, without talking about something that you apparently know something about, that we can say, all right, let's talk about religion. Everybody goes, oh, all right. <laughs> but we're not talking about religion. How about this? Can you pick up over? Maybe it's time for another drawing. Imagine planet Earth and all that entails. Humanity human intelligence, and etc. But then imagine a figure, a creature. It would be a, as opposed to an octopus, it would be more like an omnipus, <laughs> let's say. That out somewhere, in some other direction, let's say there's, there's this figure, this creature, and it has And then it has all these, that many other arms going everywhere, right? <laughs> but consider, does everybody see what the drawing is? That it has three arms gripped around this planet three-dimensional reality, everything that that entails that I already mentioned. All human activities, and etc. Uh, this is not without some basis, although I'm not telling you that there's this gigantic creature floating out in space. <laughs> but there is real validity to this, having to do with what I was just talking about, because consider there is a basis. I'll tell you one more time. I'm not, let's just, I'll assume this is allegorical, the figure, my creature. But each of its arms gripping the planet Earth, each of its arms has its own level of intelligence. Now that's not weird at all because it is the same sort of intelligence or not unlike the kind of intelligence that a fry cook has in his own hand to be able to take orders to talk to somebody and reach over there in a deep fry and hold out a frozen steak patty <laughs> and he can just reach over there without looking. His hand can look, his arm can look and get down close enough to where he doesn't drop it in his splatter, he can get down with just then an inch of it or less. Or a good carpenter, you can talk and look off and you can drive a nail. You don't have to look at it. Your arm can look at it. There is an intelligence at its own level. The three arms as you might, those of you that's been around this for a while might suspect I am pointing out or using to represent 
the three absolute minimal forces, realities, way that things move, that creates what seems to be to human intelligence reality. The reality particularly, but not limited to, but particularly that which is singularly human, which is this. Those three arms gripping this planet and everything on it, everything in it, each of its arms has its own intelligence. This is manifested, without them using my terms, in all manners of intellectual activities on this planet, from religion to philosophy to everyday wisdom to what seems to be secondary manifestations of primary activities, romantic love, fashion, fads, social intercourse, human emotions. They all can be seen to spring from one of these three legs. It has, each leg has its own form of intelligence. But you might look at this and agree with me, since I drew it and made it up, and say that, be that as it may, all right, everybody say, well, you don't have to say it, be that as it may, <laughs> that each of those arms is a story unto itself with its own intelligence. I'm talking about real intelligence. Just take my description, which all of you surely know is true, of the fry cook being able to do something that his hand has eyes. His hand and arm, as it were, has an intelligence. So you could say that there is a story. I could spend the rest of my life considering the ramifications that a human hand and arm has eyes. Maybe it has its own brain, but it has some sort of intelligence. On the surface, as intriguing as that may be, consider this. As per my drawing, the real story is beyond the, those three legs, though, the three arms. The real story is beyond that. It is out in the main body and the brain of the creature. In the same way that we could say, my God, now that you mention about driving nails and other sorts of things, that a human hand or a human arm has its own intelligence. That is, I never thought about it that way. How fascinating. I don't know. All right. Maybe. But it pales in comparison to the human brain, then like to the human brain, right? We'll assume in most cases. <laughs> with, with some people, it, the actual main body of the human organism wherein resides this, really would be the real story in comparison to this intelligence of just one arm. Thus is the situation when I say that I was going to talk about religion, for instance, or gods or economics, and I say it's not that. You can consider to start with that it is, if I say, all right, let's talk about, let's start and talk about what seems to be the human idea of a supernatural power of gods, that there is an intelligence down in here that has gripped this planet for very good reason, and in one of these arms somewhere, or maybe in pieces of them, but in one arm at least somewhere, there is that which has made this planet and the creatures there upon who can think come up with the idea of gods and religions. So it's in there. You can't get away from it. It's got a grip on this planet. And so does economic, so does love, so does hatred, so does revenge, so does everything that seems to be part of the human drama. But would not the real story be way off, beyond, outside, behind, of course, I'm limiting it now even to three dimensions, and it's more than that. That's why I say it's not simply floating in space. But where the main body, the thinking, the central thinking mechanism is of this creature, the source of these three arms, there is the real story. And there, whatever intelligence has made humans down in this one area feel religious or greedy or whatever it is. Imagine what a small area, imagine what a small thing that is in comparison to the full intelligence of this creature. In the same way that we'll assume, in most instances, the actual ordinary brain-based thinking of a fry cook excels omnidirectionally, excels the limited intelligence of his hand to be able to reach over there and to drop in little 
french fries one at a time without looking that may be the extent of his arms that may be the height the epitome of his arms intelligence that may be it a one trick arm <laughs> so you'll assume that compared to that just an ordinary run of the mill fry cook just an ordinary intelligent person the intelligence back at home base there's no comparison if you would like to try and keep all that in mind in one way or the other is what I mean when I say I was going to pull out the example or continue about man's idea the way he's wired up to think about the idea of supernatural gods and powers when that's not actually what we're talking about all right sure I was mentioning the last time we were taping of how man, since all of his intelligence is in its concepts is limited to his intelligence. That even if he says, I'm going to imagine something that is not human, I'm going to imagine gods, I'm going to imagine fictitious creatures, he can't imagine anything that is not part of his own intellect. An expansion of that, and recall I was also, we were talking about how one possible description, an operational description of this kind of activity could be a continual thinking when you don't have to. And it would be a kind of thinking very specifically past the first story, past the initial analyzation that the human intellect seems to come up with about certain areas. Well, eventually with all areas. It may not suit you particularly, but it suits somebody to say, well, blah, 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 blah. It's got a beginning and it's got an end. But if you continually think about it, and you are properly involved with this and drawn to this, that story, that initial story, will collapse, become frustrating in a way that is not even three-dimensionally, become super frustrating. All of that, I was going to expand and try and get you to expand your own looking at it, of the way man is wired up to even think about these supernatural creatures, his idea of supernaturals, the deities, the heroes, and I was pointing out that even they had a backstage, that all the stories, even though I was just using the Old and New Testament last time, the religious stories, the mythological stories, all over this planet at all times, it can't be helped, men picture the figures of these heroes, even these supernatural transcendental beings, still have a backstage. They still fool around, they trick men, they forget what they're doing, they have some sort of own private agenda that may run at loggerheads to that which they tell men is their agenda. The area that I did not hit, that almost becomes staggering in its blatant simplicity, once you can see it, is also the idea all over the planet at all times that these deities may be petitioned. <laughs> they may be prayed to, begged to, sacrifices made to, so that they will, which they can do, so that they will or may answer your petition and address, redress, some ill you have. There is no concept of supernatural powers, that is, deities and gods, anywhere on this planet at any time, as you might suspect once I point out, or you might agree, which will just warm the cockles of my you-know-what, <laughs> that anybody, any group that has an idea of a supernatural power also has the idea that in some way you can petition it, you can pray to it. And if circumstances are right and you've got enough of the big bucks or uh, whatever it takes, that the deity, the supernatural power, can respond in a positive manner and cure, treat whatever your woe is. That is a very ordinary intelligence, a very comforting, a very encouraging first story that assuming that you have bought part of the story, which to varying degrees, almost everybody on this planet, has bought some version of that story. You know, even atheists. Say, I'm glad I'm an atheist, thank God, and that kind of thing. 
<laughs> so, to varying degrees, there is a satisfying story whether you believe that you deserve for your prayer to be answered, your petition, or whether you know how to go about it, or it's been so long since you've been to confession, or whatever. There is still right in the people the general thinking that if indeed there are supernatural powers, if indeed this is not some kind of gigantic accident, etc., that there is some kind of transcendental figure somewhere, force, that it can be under the right conditions, petitioned, and under the right conditions, when things are favorable, can respond to my plea. And of course your plea is always on the basis of some ill, some woe. It's good to know. I mean, it's, even if you don't feel like you're right up to date and all your dues are not paid for the pew at the temple or you're not up to all the candles been lit or whatever it is. Except unless you keep thinking about it. Because then the one that is as simple as hell, it's not obscure. Everybody will hear me when I say it. The woes, the ills you have, for which you're petitioning assistance had to be under the control of the guide to start with. Now, ordinary intelligence can be presented with that, ordinary people. Um, about the best they could come up with is they thought that whoever said it, in this case me, if I, they thought I was seriously trying to push this view, they would have to lapse into it very best, some sort of Christian cynicism, or Muslim sarcasm. <laughs> because it does not in any way, this information will not fit into any of the belief systems of any religion, even any semi-religion, to say that there are ways that you can appeal to cosmic forces, whether they, it was some obscure cult that says, we don't really believe in the idea of a Jehovah or a Allah that's actually a guy somewhere with a beard and a big long robe. We think of it more as an impartial, well, impersonal, cosmic force. But you can in certain ways through eating good and reading New Age magazines or not listening to rock and roll that you can get yourself vibrating at some kind of agreeable frequency and get in touch with these so that you can appeal to them to help cure your asthma or whatever. But even they are not wired up to hear that. They say, well, that's fine. But how come you got asthma? I mean, these forces, if now you can appeal to them, and when the moon is just right, and of course, Jimmy Webb and the fifth dimension are in the right house, <laughs> that it will send down these blessings and cure or treat your asthma how come that they didn't know? How are you going to figure that they didn't know this force or these forces that they were giving you asthma? Why did they give you asthma to start with? And now you've got to appeal to them to take it away. There is no shelf in the supermarket of life's ideas <laughs> where this fits. There is nowhere to put that up for sale. If you put it there for sale, if you tried to, everybody's either going to ignore it I'm getting into foolish areas, but I already started the sentence. Or else you're going to put it up and everybody goes back and goes, well, something's rotten, throw that out. There is no place for it. But now consider, the part that I was going to say is staggering if you can follow this. Consider this on the basis of what I just said, which has got to be a fact. So if you keep thinking about it, you cannot buy the story that you can appeal to gods to help treat your ills because they're gods and got that kind of power, or a god or whatever, even an impersonal force, they, they were in charge. They're the ones that let you or made you, allowed you to have these ills to start with. And so now you're going to shout hosannas or whatever you shout and plead for them to cure this. And if indeed you appear to get better, holler thank you, thank you. you know, thank you for quick kicking me in the privates or thank you for getting off my foot. I'll you know, be forever grateful for you getting off my foot. The staggering part if I may remind you one more time that we're not actually talking about religion that's just got almost nothing to do with this almost nothing almost nothing all right consider the staggering possibility now of a conspiracy
between your ills and your cures. <laughs> Consider that. A collusion. Now you may wipe out, if you can f take a little, at least on a side step, away from religions and gods, you can look at it from a more psychological based view. You just wipe away the ordinary concept of religions, etc., that uh, you, or that most people today, are stressed out. That you have psychological bruises and traumas, and etc. But there are ways to treat them. In psychiatry, or even uh, psychopharmaceuticals. But there are ways to treat. Consider a collusion between all forms of whatever humans, I'm not going to try to define them all, I'll accept anything you can think of. Any human ill. It doesn't have to be just physical, but I'm not excluding anything. Anything you can think of, a human ill, all the way from having asthma, to being too short, to think your nose is too big, to being too weak, to being too fat, being too aggressive, being too shy. Any ill, anything that you woe about, Anything that you would like cured, or at least, please, treated, <laughs> consider the possibility of a collusion, an absolute, unsuspected conspiracy between whatever it is, whatever ill or woe you've got, and then the treatment or the cure. Think about it a second. If you have been following any of the last several tapings, it's inescapable. I've tried to get you to already consider, if not to see, that all things that the human intellect perceives as being fissioned, which is everything, remember, is in some form a conspiracy. No matter what it is. Truth, <laughs> error, goodness, evilness, and now let's take ills and cures. Why do you think that that in some way would be an exception? And if you can hear anything, you don't find that staggering? I mean, it's bad enough if you were following and hearing any of it last time for me to point out that truth and error, if you can begin to see it, what ordinary people call truth and error, which remember, if this helps for a second, you got this down in here, that is not the end of it. That is simply a local phenomenon. It is correct enough in one, in the intelligence of one leg of this figure that's got a grip on all of us at the ordinary level. So it should be curious enough to begin to see that there has to be a kind of conspiracy between truth and error. If we call one whole leg, that this one leg, let's say, is in charge and has been historically, is in charge of the truth on this planet. And then this other leg over here is in charge of error. All forms of error. Stupidity, dumbness, at all. But notice this. It's all the same guy, the same figure, the same creature working at all. This is a local phenomenon. And you cannot separate this leg from that leg. If this is all you see, then there you are. A conspiracy, which of course I've already pointed out to you is not a conspiracy, but once you realize if you want to start it to get you off the starting block, it is a kind of conspiracy in that you believe, that all intelligence believes that there are separate concepts all the way from morality to intelligence. Back home. So some of you should, I was hoping had already got a glimpse of that in the last few nights. But now consider, expand the horizons and look at it as being ills. <coughs> Fill in anything you want to, all the way from physical complaints to uncertainty, personality problems, anything that if indeed I said, well here is the ultimate source and force to petition. So wherever your complaint is, address it to this box down here. You know, speak into this little holes, and they'll get the message. We got problems? 
whatever you'd consider an ill, that is you and all of humanity, how can you now think that it is separate from the apparent cure or treatment? There is a kind of difference and it helps some people, you can think of it as cure slice treatment. Some of you, when it hits you, it should strike you as being staggering. I started to say when it hits you and I was going to drag in the name of that great musical philosopher Cy Oliver, but I figured that's even too old and obscure for the, even you people. You might go back and check Ray Charles, yes indeed, but never mind. When it hits you, it's staggering. I said it was not limited to physical complaints, but that should get some of you people's attention, if not many of you, since health is such an all-encompassing hobby to ordinary humanity, that we're all partially ill. We're all infirm in some way. Some people seem to be more infirm than others, that you've got more complaints. And boy, if I just had the money, or boy, if I could just tune in to some great cosmic force that would cure my continuing stomach aches, or my headaches, or my bad eyesight, or my asthma. But there, what could be further removed from one another than your ills and their possible cures? Or you are really slowing down and sinking down the mud to believe that there is that kind of separation between anything. And that that would seem to be the sort of example that would slap many people right in the face because I understand that many of you got physical complaints and that by God you'd say that you'd do almost anything to get rid of your complaint. <laughs> if you were to undertake trying to pursue a continual thinking when you didn't have to. Do you realize the kind of discomfort this can cause of going past the initial story? That if you could do it and remain an ordinary person with ordinary intelligence. That is to not only still have asthma or migraine headaches or continuing acid indigestion and then begin to get a glimpse that there was not that kind of separation between that and the cure of it. So if you're ordinary and could see some of this, which you of course, thank the gods for real justice, you can't, but if you could, you understand you would then still have acid indigestion and then the knowledge of the fact that there was really no cure. Good to see that nobody like that. <laughs> Either that or I'll, I'll hope that nobody heard it is why there was no response. But what if there's no difference? no distance. I hate to say they're the same because those two, these two legs or any of the three legs, the legs are not the same. This is, this leg is separate from that leg. But if you go beyond that, if you go beyond the visible first reasonable and of course at this level objective story that there they are and that's all you see. And so I, it's not just to say that they're the same because that leg is different. Your right arm is different from your left arm. But if you go past, instead of just looking at the two hands of the fry cook or the carpenter, would the hand ever have cooked food, ever driven a nail, ever had the idea for a house? No. Uh -huh. You had to go beyond that up to the main body of the creature, up where it actually thinks and plans, apparently. So it's not to simply say, all right, all ills and all treatments are the same. It's not that. But go past. Go past the obvious. Go past that which is reasonable. That cures and ills are two different things. Well, that's a fact. That leg is not the same as that other leg. That's a fact. I'm not saying it's not. But if you can see beyond the first story, if you can see beyond the 3D level, it would not be unfair in the beginning to call it collusion. Don't any of you waste your time calling all state looking for collusion insurance. <laughs> See, you, you just heard the ad and you misunderstood. They, they didn't say about automobiles, about collusion insurance. So. 
So don't call him, embarrass yourself. <laughs> there is a primo example of looking beyond the first story. In fact, the one that strikes me is even better than looking beyond the first story because this one on the surface, and it's very old, is considered by those of ordinary intelligence, even though they may think it's extraordinary, on this planet as being a real heavy duty allegory. Plato's cave. Those of you who don't remember that Plato, my version was more or less, of him saying that the ordinary person, just old non-philosophers, people not as intelligent, of course, as Plato and his peers, his students, he said that their life was like, that we're all living in a cave and didn't know it, but, and people were looking up and seeing these shadows on the wall acting out, love making, making speeches, attacking one another. But then, those of some more enlightened intelligence realized that there was something beyond these shadow plays. That it was they themselves causing the shadows. And that's been around for thousands of years. People still talk about it. It is used... It's an allegory that's even now used allegorically again. It is almost a sign, I guess, a shortcut. Many people in the Western world passing themselves off as being learned and academic to just throw in something about, well, at least if you live a life that's a little more insightful or you are a little more in tune with the artistic flows and the depths of culture, at least as per Plato's cave story, you cease living this shadowy life and you realize that man himself is the actor and that you've got to keep that in mind, etc., etc., and so on. It sounds insightful. And that's a, it just stops there because it does deliver some message at that level. It is an analyzation of the unexamined life, of staggering through life, and just everything seems to be happening to you, at least your perception of it, sort of in a haze, kind of smoky, shadowy. You don't feel that much in touch. It's almost as though something else is living your life, and then you realize, that's not me. I'm me. That's just a shadow of it. That's just some sort of crude reflection. Period. You can get your master's. if I guess they've already eaten up all the possibilities, or maybe not. You might even get your doctorate degree in philosophy, still pursuing that story just up to that point. Because it appears to be, and at its level, the level of that creature gripping this planet, at that level, it seems as though you have moved in a more complex, insightful manner to go from an allegory detailing ordinary people's existence as mere shadows on the wall to the point of being more enlightened by realizing that it's us, alive, three-dimensional humans, causing the shadows. Period. Nice story. Nice analyzation. But, there is information available to continue, and I'll take his story, his allegory. There is more information. If you continued thinking when you didn't have to, along such lines, you would then strike this that was already in the story, although I didn't use the term yet, that the humans are in the cave and there's a fire, and of course there has to be a source of light, is what's causing the shadows. You've got to have a source of light. So all you've got to do is think a little bit beyond that which you need to think, even trying to pursue this kind of philosophical allegory, and then you've got additional information. <laughs> the fire. If you're going to look at it as being a kind of ad hoc order of intelligence or information, then you could look at the shadow lives, as per Plato, of people who take the shadows on the wall of them and everyone else as being their life. You could look at that as being the most simplistic, primitive thinking. A little improved, a little more complex, 
is to realize we three-dimensional humans, we have our own lives and the shadows are caused by us being between the source of the light, that is the fire in this case, and we, it's our own actions. We're not watching some sort of extrinsic, out of control drama going over here in the semi-darkness. It's not a matter of spirits, evil forces, and lives just barely perceived. If you realize the shadows are not me, I'm causing the shadows, you could look at that as a being, ad hocly speaking, a higher order of intelligence. It's still automatic. It's still in the grip of this 3D figure. And that's where everyone stops. But what about the fire itself? How about beyond the three-dimensional first story that's even reasonable, logical, and as I said, in many cases, apparently insightful, that apparently makes those who consider to follow along that line of thinking that makes them more intelligent or would say, my God, this is an enlightening experience to consider that allegory in this way. Period. That's the end of it. How about the fire? How about the cave itself? We get really good. How about outside the cave? How about everything that led up to fill it in? The cave, the fire, humans inside the cave, humans becoming intelligent enough to concoct these kind of allegories, these kind of pictures. But notice, I'll say notice emphatically since the thing I get here is no one's noticing. <laughs> that there within the confines of the story, there within the confines of the cave, we have gone from one level. We went from what was essentially a two-dimensional existence of people seeing their shadows on the wall and taking that as being the example, the manifestation, the human intellectual perception of life was the shadows. But then, it's as though they stepped out of, at least partially, the shadows and became more intelligent and realized the shadows are not us, us is us. Then they became three-dimensional. End of story. That's satisfying. The creature has the planet. It's got the three arms that you can see is gripped everyone. And there is a kind of order to that that is a kind of sequential progress, but it just stops. And it seems to be satisfying if you're interested in such intellectual fall to Roy. It cannot go any further. It never goes any further. But the next further, once you begin to see it, if, unless you're, well, if you understand the fun of me playing around with justice and saying, well, this is the way it would be if people could see more and yet remain ordinary. Then what I was going to say was, it should strike some of you as, my God, how could somebody as good as Plato, whether he lived or not, but somebody that life has used as a reference point, somebody supposedly named Plato, to think this up and then for thousands, thousands, thousands of people afterwards to pursue it, to talk about it, to repeat it, to expand upon it, to do their own versions of it, and they never go any further. And if we had Plato here and pointed it out, he could say, well, sure, I could have said something about the fire, now that you pointed out. But but then intellectually, not to Plato, to the nervous system that runs all of humanity, the kind of question non-verbally you should have, such as me saying, well, hey, you shouldn't have stopped there. I'm talking to Plato. Just one piece and one arm. I'm talking to this guy, Plato. Hey, that was pretty good. But why did you just stop with humans realizing it's us? We're making the shadows. Yeah, but there couldn't be any shadows about that source without fire. So you can go past the wall, there's the wall, and then you got over here to us. Yeah, now it's three-dimensional. When you go on the fire, because there'd been no shadows to start with, about like this. When you say something about that, then Plato could say, well, you're right, I could have said something about that. The unsaid question, the thinking when you don't have to, is this. Is, well, how the fuck didn't you? <laughs> I will hope that you're not laughing just because I went, why the fuck didn't you? You understand? I'll tell you again, we're not talking about Plato or any human. It's that the human nervous system, I can play both parts, and some of it verbally sounds so simple because verbally, 
I can say, well, there are three arms. There are three things running the life. And if you try real hard, you can say, yeah, you're right. Sometimes I can realize there are not two things. There are at least three things. Boy, what great progress. I'm glad I met you. Thank you. That's nothing. That's that. The real story is beyond that. In Plato's case, using him exemplary. If he said, well, I could have. And then I said, well, why the fuck didn't you? The point is, he didn't. That was the first story. That was the initial analyzation, and that was all that's required. Yeah. He could put it this way. Well, I could have, but I never thought to. All right, there's the same thing. Well, I could have, but, oh, I don't know. I just, I didn't. There you are. Well, yeah, I hear what you're saying. I could have carried the allegory further and said something about fire. Well, why didn't you? Of course, that's not a real question, because I know why didn't he. But when you see it, then you understand, why didn't he? That stories only go so far. That is, energy is transformed, transmitted only as it's needed. And it's not needed for people to go any further than, and of course there's still people, in using Plato's allegory, that still take the shadows on the wall as them. The more primitive, the more simplistic people throughout the world, and they're not all in New Guinea. Some of them are in New Jersey, New Rochelle, New Mexico. Some of them are living very close to you in your neighborhood. I don't want to frighten you. But the more simplistic intelligence is, they take the shadow life as being life. Then those just, but it's still, even though it's, it is a kind of evolutionary improvement, it is still mechanical, it is still automatic, but there is the next stage at which the general population of the intellectual world now constitutes we take the allegory and say, well, I, I understand, there's more. We, we, we don't fool around worshiping trees or frogs, and I don't believe in astrology. I don't believe that the dead's alive and hanging around my house and hiding my socks. <laughs> yeah, I don't believe in that kind of simplistic two-dimensional existence. Life is more complex than that. In a very mechanical way, that is evolutionary. But it stops there. That's all that's necessary. And for me to ask Plato or anybody, which all I'm doing is playing the game of asking the main trunk of human intelligence, hey, you come up with these stories, these allegories, these pictures, these proverbs, these truths. Yeah? But if you'd went one step, if you'd gone one step past that, if you, instead of putting a period there, if you'd put a semicolon or a comma and then gone on, instead of just saying, we are not shadows. We're not vague, fairly nondescript, two-dimensional movements in semi-darkness. We're in the light. We're three-dimensional. We're humans. And that was just simply our shadow. Well, why didn't you go ahead and consider, well, wait a minute. We're here in a cave. We're throwing shadows. And I, I individually, the person who said this, using Plato's example, I have gone past the point of taking the shadows, the two-dimensional, flat, crude, primitive appearance of human existence as being me. I've gone beyond that. I'm to the point of realizing that I'm the one causing the shadows. All right, right, right. Good, good, good. Why didn't you go even further? Because there's something beyond you. Into the fire itself. How'd the shadows get there? Why, why stop there? Uh... And the O uh would be, if it was that intelligent, that, well, yeah, you're right, I could make some kind of allegorical something about that. Why didn't you? It wasn't necessary. I never thought about it. Oh, I don't know. I died. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I don't know. That became so popular. You know, I ran with that. You know, what the hell? It, they paid the bills and kept me out of the old folks' home, the old philosophers' homes. I, you know. I could have thought about it. Now that you mentioned it, I can think about it right now. Hey, don't bother. If I got to tell you, you know, somebody tells you, don't you think about this, it's too late. You should already thought about it, right? The fire, the cave, that is everything beyond the three-armed creature. You've got to get beyond, no matter how reasonable, no matter how satisfyingly analytical it may seem. If you don't go beyond that, you're not going to go beyond that. <laughs> Uh, something else from a few nights ago. You remember the story 
I brought up with a guy who was a retired example I made up. I brought up retired military man seeing people out, youngsters, non-military people out paying money to buy uniforms and go out and play weekend warriors and the guy marveled or worse. How could people do that? Being, playing soldier ain't fun. And I pointed out to you that contraire, that playing somebody that you don't have to be is always fun. Everybody recalls that. That's where we dropped it that night. In the case of attempting to do this, in a sense, you are then beginning to pretend to be you, but with a new backstage. You got to have a new backstage. And you start playing like you're you. But I want to clear up. Nobody's ever written me or called me on this. But now's a good time since I'm going to twist it to my nefarious purposes anyway. To point out that actually pretending to be you, beginning to play you with a new backstage though, new backstage, is not doing a satire of you. I continue to lose satire in the ways they recall me, and I know the definition of satire. And satire is an attack on the folly, the folly and vice of life, of human behavior. It's not a satire you do. And normally when I say satire, it was just an easier word and I didn't ever want to stop once I started using it. It is really a burlesque. <laughs> because I know the definition of burlesque. And burlesque is taking the serious work of someone else and treating it in a humorous manner. <laughs> and there is a difference. <laughs> so, to begin, once you know how, to begin to start playing you. Pretend to be you. You're not doing a satire of you because you're not in some way pointing out the folly of you because there is none. You're not trying to hold up to some sort of ridicule your vices because there are none. Unless you're going to fall into the same backstage, the old backstage that you and everyone else attributes even to your gods. That is, remember you're good old western god of putting Adam down there and saying you've got free will do anything you want to except that and then made it absolutely irresistible to where you had to do it <laughs> that would be the same thing as an ordinary person doing a satire of themselves that is well I'm going to attack my vices what vices it'd be like taking the story on the surface and going no further which since guilt is a real not emotion a real energy People are subject to it, and so people who are not all that religious can hear that the gods are a little teed off at humanity. You know, it would be a surprise, and even non-religious people say, well, I don't particularly believe in the personifications of individual gods, but as far as the universe and nature not being all that pleased with us, I can agree with that. I mean, look at what we're doing to the atmosphere. Look at what we're doing to the poor environment. So people will, in, will buy right into that story. You're wired up to do so. You didn't lose your place there. That is that the gods created Adam and Eve and said, all right, you got free will. I'm going to turn you loose and you take this place over. Do anything you want to except one thing. And then the first thing he did, well, almost the first thing, was that. That would be the same sort of first story that the gods had such a backstage that now they attacked their own creation. That would be an ordinary person or anybody doing, a, in truth, a satire themselves because you would have to be attacking your folly and your vices. Wherein, if you can see past the three-dimensional level, where are they? You can start naming them for me, but if you can, I don't know what the hell you're doing here. You'll be back with a priest or a rabbi or a psychiatrist or your mama. There is nothing to ridicule. You've got no vices. You've got no follies. But if you've got a new backstage and you can then, which you've got to to varying degrees unless you're going to become a hermit. If you're going to become a hermit, what are you doing here? And if you are a hermit, you're not even hearing this, so why am I bringing it up? <laughs> 
you would be doing a burlesque as opposed to a satire. The definition, I remind you again, in the literary sense, which is fine with me, the dictionary sense. To burlesque something is to take the serious work of another and to treat it in a humorous way. Now, I think we're getting somewhere. Because you're not satirizing yourself since you've got no vices and follies to hold up or to attack or to ridicule. But if you're doing a burlesque, you're taking the serious work of another and treating it humorously. Now, what might we be referring to? Some of you are already smiling, so maybe you already think you know where I was going to verbally pounce. What could be a more serious work of another? Then this figure's grasp of your own perception and acceptance of your old backstage. Of what you are. What can be more serious than that? Forget about Das Kappa or Plato's writings or religious books as being serious. That's not the serious kind of work that I'm referring to for you to do a burlesque of or for Mad Magazine to take on the works of Balzac or <laughs> Rousseau and to burlesque them to take a serious matter, remembrance of things past, you know, just begging for it, to burlesque it. <laughs> Forget about literature. What is a more serious work of everybody than themselves? That's a serious work. That's everybody's, whether well, they, of course, know it or not and would never describe it, but that is the prime cut of seriousness in their life is themselves with all their vices, all their follies, blah, blah, blah. Each person at the ordinary level, each person back in the same old grips of those three arms, everyone is their own serious work. And to begin to have the fun, recall I didn't repeat it in toto when I responded to this retired military man who said, that's not fun, pretending to play, to pretending to be a soldier. You know, what I originally pointed out to you, it's always fun. I want to remind you of that adverb. Always. Always. At the three-dimensional level, anybody that is wired up to want to pretend to be somebody. It's always fun or they wouldn't be doing it. You ought to understand that. That they, on the weekend, dress up in some kind of phony baloney police uniform that they bought somewhere and they put a little blue light on their dashboard and they like to run up and down the highways <laughs> pretending to be a cop. And cops are off duty for the weekend and stressed out and drunk and taking drugs and feel like this job's going to drive me nuts to see somebody doing that and they think, why does somebody take their time off and spend their weekend doing that? Why don't they get drunk or go hunting and fish or something, you know, reasonable. <laughs> but it's always fun, even at that level. So now back to a level beyond that <coughs> to begin to pretend to be you from a new backstage perception is always fun but it is not a satire even though I use that term I'm not going back just to straighten out my terms but I want you to understand you're not doing something in some ways trying to compensate for what you were such as a satire is it can be twisted and described in other ways, but in a sense, even amongst people out there, a satire is an attempt to compensate that somebody who is satirizing some political folly as they see it, some liberal writer trying to satirize some right-wing fallacious philosophy. The satirization is an attempt to compensate for it. But since you've got no vices, since you've got no follies, there is no satire going on because there is nothing to compensate for. But what it is by God is burlesque. Because you are now treating in a humorous manner, may I remind you of my term brain smile. Because you do not have to go around wearing baggy pants and a funny nose and glasses. Because the burlesque is just between you and you. Well, you and me and you. 
and the creature. <laughs> but it's not a satire because you're not compensating, you're not trying to attack, you're not trying to change through the satirization of some of your shortcomings and your flaws because there were none. You're just simply taking the previous show going on, on your stage, what has been you up until now, which was serious work. I don't know why I keep saying which was serious work because you know damn well it was serious work. You wouldn't even be here were it not serious. Because you've been staggering around looking for something, whether this turns out to be it or not, of something to help you with your serious inquiry into you and your vices and follies and shortcomings, and etc. You can't do a satire of you. Not if you're doing this. You can do a burlesque. Because you're certainly not treating this past serious work in a serious manner anymore. You can't. It's not possible. If you are, you've got no new backstage. You're backstage, and you could now try and call it a burlesque, but what you're doing is still contemplating, and it's not actually writing and performing a satire. That you're still woeing yourself about your ills. That, boy, I wish my ills could be cured. I wish my vices and my follies, in some way I could compensate for them, because then I'd be a better person. Then I'd have this new intelligence, or then I'd be more awakened or more conscious or whatever it is. You're playing satire. And there's a good definition from somebody of what satire is. They used it, this was out in the ordinary world, whoever did it. That satire is that which closes on Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> well, it may have been Saturday. The point is, satire is that which closes the day after it opens. Which was a critical and theatrical comment on what a touchy ephemeral and hard to sell thing be satire to start with out on the stage of life theatrically speaking but now that I thought about it it fits right in it is just a simpler statement having to do with how hard what I was trying to tell you that satire is anyway if you're trying to do it to yourself it won't fly it'll close up and that's not what this is about but it is a burlesque how else can you treat this seriousness which was an imposed play that you were in the grip, if you want to look at it this way, to carry the allegory further here in the last 90 seconds, that these three arms is what made you do your play, believing that you're not measuring up to what the three arms wanted, that you've got flaws, you've got shortcomings, your life is just filled with the good old V's and the F's, the vices and the follies, and so at the very least you should be engaged in some kind of satirical attack a burlesque. That's the only thing possible. And you don't have to try. If you get up and you backstage, if you really get into whatever this is and start doing it, even when you appear to be serious, which sometimes you've got to if you're not a hermit. And sometimes you've got to appear to be you. That Somebody says, wait a minute, aren't you so-and-so? And you think, oh, shit, all right, yeah, I am. <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe there's some reason. Maybe it's, maybe it's to your financial benefit. You have to say, yeah, I am. But you're not. Because if you are, you're back in the grip of this thing. If you are, you have bought the original first story. That is, in your case, that yes, I'm me. Yes, who called me? Yes. We don't particularly like you. I don't blame you. I have a kind of a, satiric, a satirical, some guy told me that, attitude toward myself. You're back doing it. The satire will close up the next night. You can think that you're doing a satire. That is, I think I'm trying to cure my ills. I'm trying to work on myself. No, you're not. You can think that, but the damn thing will be closed tomorrow night. You'll be back on the street, and you won't realize it. It's not a satire. The only thing possible is a kind of unspecified, I call it brain smile for you, is you treating in a humorous manner that which was someone else's serious work, remember. That's the definition. Someone else's serious work treated in a humorous manner. Yeah, but I'm not somebody else's work. Oh. Uh. So you mean you're responsible for that damn mess? Well, no. No, 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 not exactly because, see, there's this backstage to me. I'm not just what you see. Do I make my point? 